Good afternoon, this is Michael DeVille and we're coming from beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. I am privileged to have Walter Zimmerman with ICAP uh, with us today. This is a uh, Creating Wealth webinar and we're going to discuss uh, the economy. We're gonna discuss some of the uh, events that are going on. We're gonna talk about the markets. We're gonna talk about interest rates and hopefully if we have a little bit of time, we'll talk about real estate. But I wanna introduce Walter Zimmerman. I've known him for a long time. He's a brilliant, wonderful man. And of course, you'll see him from time to time on Bloomberg News, or you'll see him on CNBC, and he's graciously uh, uh, agreed to meet us with us today. So hi, Walter, how are you? It's good to see you again. Great, thank you. Uh, now that you've raised the bar too, so high, I hope I won't disappoint your viewers. <laughs> oh, there's not possible. You know, I, I did want to bring up a couple things. You made an amazing uh, call on oil that you've been talking about uh, really almost for 17, 18, 19 months. You were looking for oil to drop to $17.30 a barrel, but you did it from a very, very long perspective. And that goes back to your type of work. So um, I, I, you're an expert in Elliott wave analysis, are you not? Yes, yes, yes. So how did, how did that come about? Well, um, in graduate school, I stumbled on a 30-year commodity cycle, which works exceptionally well for crude oil. So when crude oil spiked to 150 bucks in 2008, that was my timing window for a 30-year cycle high, which meant 15 years of decline into 2023. And so the, the, the time cycle gave me the timing, and Elliott Wave from 150 a barrel gave me the target of hitting the teens by 2023. And then as the pattern was unfolding, that target for the teens remained intact. And the last rally was into um, 2017, 2018. Brent crude hit 17, uh, it hit 87 on the rally, but that was a failure into key resistance. So the target for the teens remained intact. And then coming into 2020, I was still targeting the teens, but ideally into 2023. But then COVID-19 came along and I call COVID-19 the great accelerant because anything that was gonna happen anyway in the markets happened much more quickly. Uh, declines that would have taken years took months. Declines that would have taken weeks took days and no market was immune for this. So I notified clients, well, I know I've been talking the teens for crude by 2023, but we shouldn't be surprised if we see it this year because of the accelerant nature of COVID-19. And sure enough, um, we saw 1598 Brent and, and a nice rebound from there. Now, that cycle low is still due out in 2023, so I suspect we may see a double bottom out in that timing window. I don't think the problems of crude oil are done yet. Um, and, and this goes to drill baby drill means glut baby glut. There's a chronic glut of crude oil, of gasoline, of diesel, um, of natural gas, and that's going to be impacting the markets for years. And of course, you've got some, some very uh, substantial changes in the economy where people are going to uh, electric cars, electric vehicles. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I did a 40 page report on the electrification of ground transportation back in December, pretty much concluding that by 2030, it'll be difficult to buy an internal combustion engine. Uh, and at the same time, there's a revolution going on in electrical generation that uh, there's a utility in Australia, a wind farm with a big Tesla battery that is driving the natural gas and coal electrical generation business bankrupt, basically. So that's another level of dramatic transformation on top. So uh, in your cycle, does your cycle, uh, is that also a commodity cycle with the oil? So are you saying you think commodities will be down until 2023? Yes, and actually, uh, well, that, there won't be any sustainable relief until 2023. But then for the oil sector, I don't know if there'll ever be a sustainable recovery because of the wave of electrification that's approaching. And curiously enough, there is a, an equity time cycle that has a major low due into 2024. 
So 2023, 2024, it looks like deflation will be uh, the prevailing force until we're through that, that timing window. So do you think that's kind of like a, a um, we're going to work through all the problems? Because I know we have an awful lot of zombie companies. We have an awful lot of bonds that really shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been issued, an awful lot of debt that shouldn't have been issued. Yes. And I know the Federal Reserve is doing absolutely everything they possibly can to keep, uh, keep the ball rolling. But a lot of these companies really just don't have the wherewithal to, to really service the debt. Is, are you thinking that this is kind of like a, a, a reset that's going to be coming through in the next couple of years? Yes, I do. And, you know, I think we can give up on inflation because with so much money looking for the slightest uptick in return, um, traditionally inflation begins with commodities, seeps into manufacturing, and then eventually ends up in wages. But every time a commodity has tried to rally since 2008, there's been an avalanche of funds pouring money to drill more, mine more, grow more. So you get a short spike in commodities and then an enduring collapse in years of overcapacity. And that's because the Fed has made people so desperate for any kind of return. So the, the law of unintended consequences, I think, applies here. The Fed's desperation for inflation is making inflation impossible. And with a giant debt bubble, you really need inflation. And, and if you don't get it, you're in trouble. There's deflationary forces that can be crushing for a debt holder. So I guess to, to follow on with that, if you think we're not going to have any inflation, are you thinking that interest rates are going to stay fairly low for the next four or five years? Yeah, I don't see any way even the Fed can allow them to recover because now the Fed is holding billions in assets whose value will collapse if interest rates recover. The Fed would have to be bailed out by Congress if they let, let interest rates recover because all their assets will get crushed. The, all, everything they've been buying will get crushed if interest rates recover. Well, it's funny, I'm doing a, I'm doing a webinar next week and one of the themes was it's bonds, James Bonds. <laughs> license to fill your portfolio. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you got to be out of bonds because debt, debt would just be the worst thing in the world to possibly have. And in any kind of rising interest rate environment, it's just going to destroy that. So you know, so what do you what do you think the the Federal Reserve is going to do? I, they keep they keep saying and and uh, they keep promising we're not going to go negative. We're not going to go negative. And the more they say that the more it thinks we're going to go negative. Yeah, the more it sounds like statements of desperation and hope than of assurance. Um, and the other issue here is the Fed has, on purpose, created another bubble in equities. This is the wealth effect. If they can get the stock market up, the theory goes, people will borrow more and spend more and will recover. But they've recreated the same overvalued stock market we had in early January. And Powell owns this bubble. It's priced, the stock market is priced for perfection again. So anything less than perfection that comes along, the Fed's going to have to throw something at that. It's going to have to buy more. It's going to have to have some new program. And it puts the Fed in a very difficult position. They, they own this bubble and they can't allow it to burst. But how do you prevent a bubble from bursting? Well, do you think they're going to be going into some of these um, yield curve controls that they've been talking about? This is, in the, this is in the news right now. Do you think they're going to be exploring that? I know we went negative for like two or three days, really, on the, on the 30 and 60 day uh, bills. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in my business, you know, most of my clients are baby boomers. They're yes. looking for an income stream for themselves. And, yes. you know, as the, as the uh, rates get suppressed, there's really nowhere for them to go to earn income. And even though their stock portfolio may be, may be up, they have to keep selling their, their assets in order to pay the bills. Yes, and they pr retire people probably shouldn't be 100% in equities as they are now, <sighs> but they feel they have no choice. And that makes these huge swings even worse. Everybody I know that's retired 
wakes up in dread at what the stock market has done overnight because their retirement is at stake. And this is a terrible situation for the Fed to have forced this on them. But the Fed sees no choice. It's, it's a difficult situation all, all around, really. So, um, so far as yield, so like a baby boomer, they're kind of, where, where do you go to get yield? I mean, re- literally, where do you go to get yield? Yeah. I mean, most of these pension funds, that, that I talk to pension funds, and of course, they have a 4% burn rate, you know, because yeah. pay- they have a payout. And a lot of the pensioners, of course, are no longer adding to the pension. They're yeah. subtracting from the pension. So yes. they've got this, they've got this no yield and they've got uh, their, their balances keep dropping. And of course, this is going to add to a pension explosion and a pension crisis in the not too distant uh, future. I don't know what can be done about that. Oh, absolutely. The business I'm in, nobody has a pension. So I, when I talk to people that have a pension, they say, oh, how are you going to retire without a pension? And I'm like, are you sure you have a pension? <laughs> yes. How yeah, funded look- is your pension? Have you looked into it recently? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless you're with the federal government, I think you're in trouble. You know, because the states are broke. Yeah. The, yeah. The states are broke. I mean, wh- how is Illinois going to fund a pension? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> How's this going to happen? Yes. How is California going to? I don't know if they can put the electrical lines in in California, let alone fund the, fund the baby boomers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's bad news on tap. There's no doubt about it. And the Fed is now in a position where they can't allow bad news. Uh, so it's, it's not, and plus just over these last few weeks, the stock market has formed this, what's called the gap island reversal top. It gapped up, stayed high for a few days, and then gapped down. Now you normally see that kind of pattern in very volatile commodities or in penny stocks, or you saw it a lot in the dot-com bubble. But the S&P 500 showing a gap island reversal top, and this most recent rally attempt when the Fed announced they were going to be buying corporate debt uh, for individual corporations, you had a strong rally. Where did it peak out? Right in the midpoint of the gap down. So the whole situation is the most ominous picture I've ever seen in the stock market in 40 years. Uh, 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 The S&P 500, 100, NASDAQ, uh, New York Stock Exchange composite, they shouldn't be acting like penny stocks, but they are. Well, and the NASDAQ hit a a new high. Yes, it did. And and of course, you know, we have not really felt the effects of the recession, because as you say, this, this, Catalyst just we were standing on the edge of a cliff to begin with because you could see in industrials manufacturing and and freight were all slowing down radically and then we had this catalyst just come in and just knock us literally off a cliff yeah and I don't know that we've really noticed the fact that there's no earnings absolutely absolutely and regard the Nasdaq actually the Nasdaq never broke down like m- m- most other indices did so I had a, still had a target for new all-time highs in the Nasdaq and we hit that target but now what you know and, and the Nasdaq when you look at it is about as far from the reality of the average American as you can get it's Netflix um, uh, the uh, Apple uh, Amazon it's uh, Everybody's buying those handful of stocks and that's powering the NASDAQ. But meanwhile, where is real demand? What's happening to retail? You know, what's happening to the, what's the future of the unemployment checks? And Um, what's going to happen when the unemployment checks run out? Because we've had this, we've had a stimulus that that's come out and really kind of softened the blow for everyone. Yes. But and the liquidity that's been put into the, into the system has been just this side of unbelievable. Oh, absolutely. So you and I talked about in, in uh, 2015 and, and early 2016, you said it didn't matter who was going to be elected, the economy is going to do very, very well. Yes. And yes. I think a lot of it had to do with, the, with all the Q, QE3, I think it was, wasn't it? Was it QE3? Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. What's going to happen to all this liquidity? We just put in $6 trillion worth of liquidity in 10 weeks. Yes. And then Munchen came out and said they're going to put another trillion dollars in. 
Yeah. Well, I, I can going? understand their fear and desperation. They're pr trying to prevent the next Great Depression because that's the risk if they don't inject enough liquidity. That's the lesson from 1929, that you can't be shy about injecting liquidity. But is that going to be enough? This is an experiment without precedent. We, we can't look back and say, oh, the last 10 times we were threatened with a Great Depression, this amount of liquidity worked. There, we're, we're going where we've never gone before. Everything's in uncharted territory. So I understand their fear and their eagerness to inject more liquidity at the drop of a hat. And I, I can see that that would fully inflate the stock market bubble again. But will that recover the economy? That's an entirely different question. Well, and of course, the economy drops so far and so fast. It, it looks like maybe it's bottomed, but it bottomed at a very, very low basis. And, and yes. I think the, the technical term for the ending of a recession is that it's no longer going down. It's no longer getting worse. Yes, yes. So, so, you know, so maybe it quit getting worse, but I don't know that it's going to look much like a recovery at, at this juncture. And let's remember the last recovery was a jobless recovery. Yes. Everybody's forgotten that. They think the jobs are going to come stampeding back. Well, wait a minute. Um, what happened after the bursting of the credit bubble and the housing bubble? We had a jobless recovery, and that jobless nature of the recovery went on for years. And that was from a much higher level of employment and a much lower level of unemployment than the company is suffering from now. And, and the, the one factor that really has me worried is the gigantic spike in the personal savings rate. We have a consumer-based economy. And you look at that huge spike to like a 33% personal savings rate. It's gigantic. It just sticks out like the proverbial sore thumb on the hundreds of years of data. And you have to hope that maybe that's because consumers were not able to spend because they were stuck at home. But if that personal savings rate does not start falling sharply, then the economy's in real big trouble. So that's the one thing that, uh, if anything keeps me awake at night, it's how quickly will the personal savings rate fall off its stupendous heights? Well, you know, the U.S. consumer loves to spend. You know, I can, I can tell you that from personal experience, you know. Yes. <laughs> we think it's patriotic <laughs> in my house to, <laughs> to go and buy. So, yeah. so we do that. Of course, the U.S. consumer is holding up the world. Yes. You know, so, yes. uh, so they need to open up and get the and the retailers, of course, have really had a hard time. A lot of these guys are not going to come back. Yes. A lot of jobs aren't going to come back. Uh, yeah. A lot of restaurants aren't going to be coming back. A lot of bars. So, and, and of course, we're 70% of the economy. Most of us are in service. Yes. So if the service industry is, is really uh, in the dumps, uh, that's to be expected. Uh, it seems like as we're trying to open up the economy that we seem like we've stopped. At least we're not yeah. dropping any further. So I guess that's, that's a good sign. But if, in my limited knowledge, I remember 2000 at the, the dot-com bubble and the real estate bubble, the market had two legs down, did it not? It, didn't it, it went yes. down, it yes. up a little bit yes. and it came down again. Yes, it's yes. It's not unusual for, for a, a stock market to, to go up 40%, 41 or 42% from the bottom? Yeah, on a, it, on a rally? I, yeah the, the typical recession is a three wave pattern. You get the initial leg down, then you get a bear market correction, and then you get the final punishing leg down. And those bear market corrections in between the two major legs down can be very impressive and inspiring, but also dangerous. Yeah. If you buy into them too high, you risk getting caught in that final leg down. And I'm very confident that the initial leg down we had was only that, only the initial leg down. And this recovery, so-called recovery, Fed inflated, reinflated bubble is the bear market correction. And there's still another leg down coming. So I'm advising clients that a great alternate investment is the sidelines. 
<laughs> and instead of equities. It's like, well, what sector do you want to be in in equities? Well, there's no sector I want to be in. <laughs> the sidelines is a uh, time-tested alternative investment in times like these. So maybe cash is not trash? Is that, is that Yeah, it? maybe, maybe. And of course, real estate, investment income, you know, people do need a place to live. And that's, that's I, you know, that's something I've taken advantage of and, and, and encourage others to take advantage of. Th those rental checks help. Well, thank you for that, Walter. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. that we've been very, very concerned. You know, my asset class is very, I mean, they're all long-term. It's We don't do anything flip and, and uh, buy and flip. Most of the stuff we buy, of course, we keep for a very, very long time. Yes. And we're very, 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 very concerned. I mean, my clients are baby boomers. We can never get our money back. So we're, we're really, really careful with what our money, right. you know, so we're, right. we're, we're in that class, like apparently like you are, we're, we're looking just for single family residences where people, yes. you know, that are really kind of like entry level or just above entry level that someone can rent and live there for a long time. That, yeah. that that's, that's because our baby boomers, they need income. They're yes. not really in a capital formation anymore. They're in the, the income. They, they, they need income. They need to, they, you know what they need to do is they need to transfer their wealth into income. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, yes. very difficult to find a vehicle that they can do that. It, everybody want, loves to be in Amazon and, and uh, Apple and Netflix and, and see, their, see their asset base go up but they don't throw off any income for you. So you're yeah. constantly selling your position. And that's a very, very hard thing to do, particularly my age. No one yeah. wants to sell their, their uh, uh, nest egg at all. Right. So right. I guess the question is, uh, where do you go? Bonds, of course, are, are really at risk. I mean, you know, we're telling Absolutely. everybody to get out of bonds. You, you know, even foreign debt. I mean, I think, the, I think we may have a bifurcated marketplace where you have uh, the federal treasuries, which are, are, I think will always be good mm. and the rest of the world. I mean, literally the rest of the world, I, I think yeah. sovereign debt in, in Europe would be a crazy thing that, to own oh, or, uh, uh, emerging market debt. I think that'd be awful. And of course, what can you do with municipalities? W would you want, uh, yes. Illinois debt or California debt? I mean, yes. I, I wouldn't want that. That'd be an awful thing to have. You yeah, know? the, 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 the tax-free return is overshadowed by, will there be any return of principal? Yeah, at all. You know, know? at that. all. Yes. Yeah. So, so where do you go? So in, 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 in your opinion, we, there's a lot of risk in the stock market. Maybe yes. one more leg down. Yes. And that could be a pretty severe leg because if, if we remember the last two market crashes that we've had, the last two recessions, we've had this, uh, uh, this uh, bear market rally is pretty impressive. Yes. And then the following one was really crushing and it was really? longer. Absolutely. Brutal. Even though the economy is trying to recover. Yes. The, the yes. market was still, was, was really almost like coming to reality. Yes. And, and, and that was seemed to be like a lag. And so, so where do you hide? I mean, we can go into a little bit of real estate. What other asset class do you think you can hide in? Cash, of course. Yeah, uh, small, uh, small yeah, you know, cash. There, there's nothing wrong with with treasuries. There's nothing wrong with real estate. And the the other, I think, um, opportunity here is successful people who have been trapped in the big cities. From what I can see, are really looking to get a, a second home out in the country, and and maybe leave the city behind. And here, I think there's an opportunity not for entry level, but for more upscale, mm -hmm. because these are successful people, and they've they've the deprivations of being trapped in a tiny, though luxurious apartment in the city for an extended period of time wears thin. And I, I suspect there will be a market for more upscale second homes in areas maybe uh, one to two hours outside of, of every big city in the country. Very, very, very insightful on that. That's like being on, a, uh, on, a, on the nicest suite on a cruise ship. 
that you, you can't leave your suite. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Who'd want to do that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I'd rather be up on deck somewhere. <laughs> yes, even sleeping on deck. <laughs> yeah, sleeping yeah. on deck would be great. So <laughs> let me just segue a little bit. You know, we're, all this liquidity that's going in, do you have a time frame? Because uh, I'm looking, you know, you've helped me a little bit with, I've been following your work and, and I have a, a, a timing model myself. It looks like we're not, it looks like maybe we're going to, bottom in the next 60 to 90 days in the next quarter, but we have a very, very slow recovery. I, I'm looking, we're not even really, it may, we may have bottomed, but it's not going to, it's not going to feel like you bottomed. That, that's right. That's right. And that's, that's generally what happens. The stock market is not recovering, but somewhere out there, the economy is improving. And generally what happens is everybody gets bearish at the lows which is the perfect counterpoint to the fact that they're all bullish at the highs. Right. So the, the stock market looks worse and worse as the underlying economy is improving. And then finally you get what's called capitulation. The bulls give up, they evacuate, generally at the lows. That's the most bearish extreme, that moment of capitulation. And that's the moment of maximum um, opportunity for the savvy investor who's been sitting on the sidelines, keeping his powder dry, waiting for that capitulation to pick up assets for pennies on the dollar in, in the equities and, and otherwise. Do you think maybe still a year out, 18 months out, or do you think it'd be sooner? Well, you know, the, the, there's still that nagging problem of the time cycle says 2024 for the final lows. But then how much has COVID-19 sped that up? You oh, know? amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, you know, and, and we used to just kind of do a gradual slide into recession. This was like just falling off a cliff. This was oh, like yeah, taking this the elevator down. Door. Yeah, this was normally, you know, you take the stairs down. This was a trap door opening. This, yeah, this was exactly. This was an this, elevator shaft. This move. was like, Wow. So, so I think that's probably why we're going to, rec I think it's maybe one of the shortest recessions we've ever had. It was, it was nasty, probably one of the worst recessions we had, but what a short uh, brevity, but the recovery might be, be long. I'm, I'm thinking maybe 2022 before we really start getting back. I, I agree. I, I would have to agree with that. And, and maybe not until um, 2023 will it start looking really nice and and wonderful again. So that's um, about 18 months away. Yes. yes. So my understanding is then we put, the, if you look back at the charts, like what we did in 2015, when all that liquidity was coming into it, it took about a year and a half for that, that liquidity to work through into Main Street. And by the time yes. we got into 2016, late 2016, 2017, the economy was looking pretty good. Yes. yes. So if we, if we extrapolate that out, from now, we just got seven trillion dollars put, and, and again, it was it was like a trap. It was like a, a rocket ship straight up. It wasn't like yes. it was gradual. This was like an instantaneous ten weeks, seven seven trillion dollars, and yes. holy cow! Yes. So, do you think it's going to take that long for that liquidity lag to to start showing some effects in, in on Main Street? I, I think so because the unemployment rate was so high. It's much easier to lay people off than to re than to rehire them. It's much easier to furlough than to decide now's the time to try and rebuild the business. I think there's this um, unwillingness to jump in uh, wholeheartedly here. I think people are gonna be more cautious, more uh, careful, uh, more prudent than they were um, with the last two recoveries. Um, but we made it through the bursting of the dot-com bubble. We made it through the bursting of the credit bubble. We're gonna make it through this, but it's gonna require patience and I think caution and probably more prudent to be a little late to the party than a little early in that regard. Well, and of course, uh, once liquidity starts going, I, I guess we're looking for that virtuous cycle to start. So we start getting slowly where we've stopped going down and then people start mm. uh, spending money. Like you've mentioned in, in retail, they start taking money out of savings, start actually uh, adding furniture, buying TVs or going on vacations. 
And of course, once that virtuous cycle, so we certainly will recover, but, but you're looking at the same time frame. I think you and I are both on the same wavelength. We're looking for probably 2022 before we can say that uh, we can smile again and, and, uh, and laugh and sing and things will be better. And this relates to the fact that no pandemic in history has been one and done. No pandemic has ever been one wave. There has been a couple that were immediately geographically isolated that were two waves. Otherwise, every pandemic in history, and this is going back to like 400 BC, uh, every pandemic has been at least three waves and occupied a couple of years. And generally, it's the second wave that's the worst because the virus mutates to a more aggressive form. Now, there's nothing, nothing saying that it must be three waves again, but when you look at the history, and you can't find an example of a pandemic that was not three waves. That's another level of caution that I think uh, people who, who do the research will, will be stuck with and probably to their benefit. Okay, so, we, so we, we're going to come out of this. Yes. So we should all just kind of batten down. We should get yes. very conservative, get, get cautious. This yes. is not the time to start trying to make your fortune on a, on a, on a penny stock or no, start though uh, we no. should be calling uh trying to buy hertz at this at this level i don't imagine yeah, that's probably not well, the, that's probably not the stock <laughs> i'm glad you mentioned that that's an example of the hysteria of the bullish excess that has reinflated this bubble when the sec has to step in and tell hertz no you can't issue worthless stock even though there's hundreds of buyers for it we we won't let you do that it's, what kind of world is this when the individual investor craves worthless stock from a bankrupt company with no future given the electrification of ground transportation and transportation as a service from Lyft and Uber and God knows what else? It's just stupefying. And I think evidence of the bullish hysteria that's out there right now. Well, of course, and that's a spike. They, they, a lot of these guys got lucky on the spike because they had a very, very good uh, bear market rally. And, and yes. uh, of course, you yes. know, success begets success. Yes. And, you, know, <laughs> they, you know, if you, you have a winner, you're actually brilliant. You know, so that you're a genius. So we don't want to do that. So we're going right. to kind of sit on the sidelines for the next 12 to 18 yes. months, preserve our, I think we're in kind of capital preservation mode. Are, are we not? Absolutely. I think it's where we want to keep our Absolutely. money. Opportunities are certainly going to come our way probably some commodities coming in 12 to 18 months. Yes. Uh, we yes. might even have some shortages if, uh, if, if everybody's locked down and, and people aren't working, maybe we're, maybe we need to start thinking of getting some agricultural uh, yes. companies, uh, uh, companies into our portfolio. That might not be a bad place to just maybe put some long-term money. Agreed. I think, I think the theme here is probably safety. Are we not Absolutely. We be very, very conservative? Put it into things that are going to be very, very uh, safe and conservative. And mm -hmm. we're going to look for probably 23, 24 before things really start moving. And then, of course, the liquidity at that juncture is going to come through it, the, the system, is it not? I mean, 23 yes. should be pretty yes. good, I would think. Yes. Yeah. I, I, on the other side of this, I'm very optimistic and upbeat that it will be a better world all the way around. But... It's the meanwhile that we have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. So getting from here to there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so in, in my business, we, we still have an 18 and a half year cycle in the real estate that uh, yes. we're, we're, we're pretty, we're still, we're still kind of in the middle of it. We're not, we're not very yeah. far out. So uh, yeah. I'm thinking we're probably not going to peak until 23, 24, I think is probably where, Mm. The, the absolute peak is so that's a good place for people to go if they're conservative we wouldn't be telling people to go out there and buy any big box stores at this point but uh right, right. certainly you know mom dad and a couple kids and, and a place to put the dog and the and the and the boat alongside the house that'd be good maybe some uh treasuries probably a good place to keep your cash yes yes short-term short treasuries i think probably absolutely absolutely any thought on gold uh, gold um you know the funny thing is Every financial luminary in the world has recommended buying gold since February, but it's failed to make new highs. Every attempt to rally is met with significant selling. So during the Great Depression, gold deflated, but not 
as rapidly as other things deflated. So I think gold being long gold is just a very, very crowded trade here. And, and one, one more thing you and I have talked about, this is probably the crux of a lot of them, is the dollar. Yes. You know, we, yes. I think we're peaking here. And of course, maybe, maybe that's what's holding down the, the gold a little bit too, because the dollar is so doggone strong. Yes. It, uh, the, the, I don't know I what gold it, express, I don't know, what would gold be like if you expressed it in um, a lira or um, uh, euros? W would that yeah. be better? Yes. Um, but, you know, we're holding dollars. And, and uh, I, I think the next, between now and August, I think we're going to get a test of whether the dollar is still viewed as a safe haven. Because I'm looking for a few waves of bad news to come between now and the middle of August. And if the dollar can recover on that bad news, then it's still being viewed as a safe haven and it's gonna remain in its trading range. The dollar had some huge swings down and then up on the onset of COVID-19 and it's created a wide, wide range. And I think the dollar is probably gonna be remaining in that range for a while and that means there's room for some upside here, but within its recent range that was established early this year, earlier this year. When, when you and I talked before, you had a target of 103.8. I think we hit yes. 102.8. We, we, we touched 103 for a little bit, but you yes. thought if we had turmoil in the world, the dollar could go much, much higher. It'd go up to 120. Yes. And what we're talking about here, uh, turmoil really hasn't reached the shores yet. And uh, we've, we've had this kind of a shock. And um, I think we have one more leg down. Do you think that might be the turmoil that drives the, the dollar up to its, its peak? Well, there's a longer term time cycle in the dollar that points down for several years. Um, I still think that 103 and change was the cycle high. And this congestion is the prelude to a weaker dollar longer term. I still think longer term, the dollar's got some problems, some serious problems. Um, but near term, I think there's still this faith that if you're long the dollar, nothing bad can happen to you. Um, that will eventually wear off. And I think the next few months will be a test of whether that is still how people are viewing the dollar. Of course, that might, that might go right into our, uh, what we've been talking about too, because if the dollar starts to drop, could be because all this liquidity coming through the system, and that would drive, if we saw the dollar start to drop, we'd see commodities go up a little bit. We'd see, um, um, we'd see housing go, go up. We'd see gold go yes. up. Yes. So yes. May, maybe that's the catalyst for it. Maybe, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a falling dollar that makes it, it is the catalyst to do this. Because, you know, when they go up and they hit a peak, it's called a peak for a reason. <laughs> it doesn't go up any higher. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it comes down. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I wonder if that next leg down in the stock market is the catalyst for the decline in the dollar because all oh. the foreign money that's been pouring into the U.S. stock market because it's the only thing holding the highs right. suddenly wants to go home again. All that money wants to go home again, which means they're selling dollars, buying back into their, uh, their home currencies. Um, maybe that final leg down in the stock market is what breaks the back of this dollar strength and inadvertently sets the stage for a recovery in prices and commodities and real estate, uh, just like you mentioned. Well, so, so we're going to wrap it up for most, most of my clients and, and a lot of people that are, that are listening to are, they're, they're really uh, Main Street investors. They're, they're really not uh, anywhere near, no one's going to call them elite. So for them, safety of principle is probably the number one concern you, you would have, is that you need to really talk to your financial professional, find out what kind of uh, risks that you're taking, assess your risks, uh, probably lean towards maybe uh, getting out of the bonds as much as you can, because I think bonds are probably hugely at risk. And yes, maybe transferring yes. money to U.S. Treasuries and getting into something very, 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 very uh, short duration, maybe anywhere from uh, some bills to some really short notes. Huh? Yes. And, yes. Um, and then maybe uh, and then maybe watch uh, their stock portfolio. Talk to your professional on that. Make sure that they, mm. they have uh, the appropriate exposure mm. because in the next 60, 90 days, we may have an event. 
So the next 60, yeah. 90 days, probably the end of this bear market rally, yes. and we'll see how far down we go. Yes. But longer term, we're very rosy. 18 yes. to 24 months out, I think we are back to at mm. least a much better economy from where we are. Yes. Would you say that's about, I recap that well? Uh, absolutely. And, and if people want to follow my outlook on these things, we have a website, ICAP Technical Analysis. They can sign on for a free trial. Look at all the years of market calls I've been making, um, tutorials um, covering the S&P, commodities, currencies. Um, that, that, that's, that's a resource they may want to check out um, on, on their own. So, Well, yeah, particularly in the next 60, 90 days, there's going to be some Absolutely. really... Really interesting time to get to get your advice. Might be a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, the pace of change has been so unprecedented. When I sit down to do my week ahead outlook, it takes as much time as it used to do for my month ahead outlook. And when I sit down to do my month ahead outlook, it takes as much time as it used to take for the year ahead outlook. It's trying to drink from a fire hose. Yeah, there's, right. just, there's just so much going on. It's a really challenging to keep my clients on top of things and avoiding the potholes and, and, and on safe ground. It's, it's, it's very challenging times all the way around. Well, it's a Chinese curse, isn't it? May your life oh be Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Please, can it be less interesting next time? <laughs> Walter Zimmerman, thank you very, very much. We're gonna stop the recording right now. So Walter, thank you so very much for your time. It's been great, deeply appreciated. Thank bye you bye for now. Me. Okay, bye-bye.